mentioned that poetry books do sell. And I hope more publishers recognize that. I hope that they realize that there is a huge interest in poetry that uh, for some reason doesn't seem to be recognized at all. And I think uh, you know, publishing poetry is a very, very fraught activity. I think it's a little different in Paris, and that's what Olivia will talk about. So um, we did have a discussion earlier about the way it works here and the way it works there. And I found myself in the Olivia a little bit. So would you like to tell us how it works in uh, Paris? In Paris? Yes. So our, I, I need Paris to have a talk and uh, have an exchange, exchange about our experiences of uh, publishing poetry from the side of the poet, not the professional uh, publisher. Um, I thought that, uh, I mean, you have uh, several books I do too, and so we have a kind of uh, experience. Um, and we could begin with the question, uh, how did you get uh, published uh, your first book of poetry? See, I started writing, I did not call it poetry, it was verse, I was eight years old, mm -hmm. and um, somebody that my family knew, you know, she's a journalist, a young journalist, and she said, it's, you know, we should get this published, the children should be encouraged, mm -hmm. which I think is very important. And uh, she actually went around to a lot of newspaper offices and said, you know, this is very good poetry, I was a you know, child, you must publish it. And they said, oh, she's a child, why should we publish poetry? Why is a child? And finally, a paper called Bharat Jyoti started a children's page and published some of my work. And uh, as I grew older, I, I must have been about 15 or 16 when I started looking at poetry seriously, as, you know, a, a, with a more mature eye. And uh, wherever I went, people would say, oh, but no one's interested in poetry. Nobody publishes poetry. Missing Ezekiel, he was like, you know, the, the father figure, the grandfather figure of contemporary Indian English writing. And he self-published, really is. Yes. There was no shame in that. He had Adi Chasawala, Deep Patel, Arun Parakkar, Adi Krishna Merotra, they, they formed the Writers Collective in the 70s and started Clearing House, which has published some wonderful books. And a uh, few years later, there was another group of writers, Vilitis, Santan Rodriguez, Melanie Cesaro, and Raul de Dama Rose, who also formed a collective to publish their own work under the title of New Ground, before the book Three Poets. So we always grew up believing that, OK, if the big publishers don't publish us, that's absolutely fine. We will get on with it anyway. If you belong to this you know, subspecies of writers who do not make money for the publishers, that's fine, it doesn't matter. Because like other mentioned in the book that he, you know, he wrote the foreword for New Ground, for three poets. And he says, we've heard it before, publishers say poetry doesn't sell. We've heard it before, we're not impressed. <laughs> so my book happened the same way with a small, in fact, Adil published my book through a small press that they started for Zach Maxis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was, you know, limited print run, limited distribution. But, yeah, I mean, I think work speaks for itself, whoever the publisher is. <coughs> and, yeah, it, you know, it was okay. It turned out fine. And you were telling me yeah, about the fans. Then when we go back on this matter, because distribution is important. Distribution yeah. is very important. You know, put your words, or people are strong, it has to be because it will spread by itself. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, my, my first, uh, I don't have my first collection here. It is a particular uh, situation because uh, I am a global uh, writer, and in India it, it's normal, but uh, in France we are terribly monolingual people. The main language is French, and the um, languages of France, which are many, are not uh, really recognized. They are not helped. Uh, the country didn't uh, 
choose to sign the chart of the minority languages of Europe. And I write in French and Occitan, which is the Provence language, the Provence also, we can call it. The correct name is the Occitan. I will say this here because it's not the matter that I have entered in poetry writing only in Occitan. When I began, it was Occitan. And um, it was very special because um, people reading poetry, oh, I not that much, the people reading Occitan poetry without translation, you know, even less. And so this that first collection was published by a specialized Occitan uh, publisher. Um, and after that book, it was a small collection, I thought that I had to face reality. And if I wanted to share my words, uh, I had to uh, publish bilingually. So, uh, I tried to translate my Mexican poems, and it was bad. It was impossible to, to have a French translation satisfied if I was comparing it to the Occident text. So I decided to write bilingually. So my process of writing is that I have two pages and I wrote simultaneously in Occitan and French. And there is not any language which is more original than the other. And then I will speak about artist book later, we spoke a little bit about it. But then something quite also uh, unexpected happened is that my next collection, in the sense classical collection with many poems inside, was published in England. It's, uh, it's this book, and so it's a publisher called uh, Clive Wootzel, who is in London. Uh, this is the translation of this book, which is a French, um, Occitan and French inside. But it has been published in England first because the publisher was very, uh, I would say, quick. So in six months or no, yeah, yeah, eight months it was done, right? Um, okay. Now, so, I think some of us grow old waiting for our books of poetry to be published. Yes, because the common delay. It's two years between, you know, when you give the manuscript, I, I guess it's the same here? Yeah, it could be longer. It could be longer, yeah. Could no, be longer. The common delay is two years. Um, but he has some reasons, because he's working on some anthologies, and he has, uh, I would say, marketing reasons to publish the collection before the anthology. Uh, and so this French book, well, Occitan and French book, but published by a, a French publisher. Because I decided I could have published Occitan and French collections with specialized Occitan publisher. The problem is distribution. And also the number of copies is uh, not very important. So I decided to work with uh, I would say national uh, French uh, publishers. This publisher called the Grand Odyssey was the director of uh, Edition Cigars, which is a reference for French poetry. He decided to leave Cigars because Cigars gets by by an Italian company, a very, very capitalist, and it's the opposite of all the History of uh, Seger's publishing house, who published all the poets of the resistance. So, um, 
the distributor is Harmonia Mundi, which is very well known also for distributing music and books. So in France, uh, poetry, the number of copies, the classical number, would be around 500. Which is about the same than the public in India. Yeah. And uh, the right about distribution, I think, is an issue everywhere. Mm. Uh, yeah, I actually had a, you know someone who worked at the publishing house telling me it's very distinctly, oh, poetry books are so thin, you know, they're so thin on the bookshelves. You can't, you can't have a poetry book on the bookshelf and expect it to sell. And what is poetry? It's like, you know, Two words on a page, two words on, in a line, you know, not two words. It's not like a novel, you know, which has so much oh, substance. I said I can't even begin to get into this conversation with you because it's not worth my time. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't, as a publisher, you don't understand something as basic as what goes into writing a poem and publishing a poetry book. I'm sorry that it's not for discussion. I can mm -hmm. <laughs> So, uh, I think that is an issue everywhere. But what is always, uh, surprised me is that, you know, we keep saying poetry is not something that interests people, but I have been associated with a lot of poetry movements in my city, and uh, in 1986, we had started a group called Poetry Circle, the three of us who started it. I must confess, I was also a little skeptical, I said, oh, no, I think no one's interested in poetry, I don't know this sort of so you know, I was in condition like so process. And at the first meeting, there was no standing room. There were people sitting out of the corridors. There were lawyers, there were architects, there were bankers, there were customs officers. All of them just common interest in writing poetry. And, oh yeah, not everything is good. I mean, there's quite a lot of bad poetry going out there, especially now that we can tend to see that. But uh, the fact is that this fundamental interest was there. And as I went along, I realized that if publishers just recognize this, that you know, there is this massive interest in writing poetry, and if these people can be tapped, and they can be made to buy poetry books, that is a huge market out there, just for people who are actually trying to write poetry. Good or bad is a separate issue. But they're there. Now, there's another movement that uh, I associated with called the 100,000 Poets for Change. It's a global movement. It started three years ago with two themes of peace and sustainability. In the first year, it started by Michael Rottenberg in the US. In the first year, in 2011, on a single day, there were 700 poetry events around the world. Since then, it has grown to musicians for change, photographers for change, artists for change, filmmakers for change, puppeteers for change, minds for change. But it all started with the kernel of poetry. And it is there and it is waiting to be tapped and why are publishers saying that it is not of interest to them and they should not waste their time. I've never understood this. I organized a poetry festival last year for 100,000 Poets for Change and the bookstore was that. I'm organizing one next week and at the same venue and I'm um, hoping to get a larger crowd. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why, where this perception comes in. Where, where do you think this happens? Why do you think people believe poetry? Well, it's in France it's not exactly like that. It's not uh, right. Because uh, we have uh, we have readers and uh, we have events, many events. We have the spring of poetry. Uh, all over the country for a month in March, there are events in the cities. And uh, we have the market of poetry in Paris. Is it a large market? Yeah, it's a book fair dedicated to poetry. Okay. And we have you know, 250 publishers. Poetry? Yeah. But more than it in the country, but the market of poetry, they come. Yeah, there are often 150 publishers. We have, in France, poetry publishers are specialized in poetry. 
The Anglo-Saxon wine is not like that. My English publisher, he publishes story books, novels. Uh, but in France, uh, the majority of poetry publishers, they only publish poetry. And so this publisher uh, decided to treat um, uh, the publishing of poetry as any other uh, literary gender. So uh, he did big efforts on uh, uh, having reviews. Um, he speaks about his books on TV because he has a real um, the woman who works for press in this publishing house, she works also in another publishing house, a very big one, and she does the same work for him, with the same tools and the same way of thinking. And it works, even if it's poetry. We speak about poetry on TV, on radio, it's very often on radio. And he decided that um, this book is published uh, uh, first edition, if there is only one edition, is uh, for the moment is one uh, thousand two hundred copies, which is a lot for France. He did some books, two thousand copies. He does the anthology of the Spring of Poetry. I think it's uh, three thousand copies, and he sells. This is the important thing because you get good copies, but if you don't sell, you don't care. But he sells it, so it's really possible to market poetry. But it's a uh, work of every day. We have uh, like 365 days in a year. It has 250 events a year. Reading and reading. On the other hand, I'm speaking to a few poet friends and I ask them their experiences in publishing their poetry and they said, you know, if the publishers bring out your book, if they expect you to be grateful, they, stay, you know, they want you to recognize that they're doing you a favor. And of course, they're not going to promote your book because that costs money, and why should they waste their time? And we often wonder, I know that other poets have also wondered about this, that okay, you, you say that you're not going to promote the books. Then you turn around and say, see, the poetry the books don't sell. We told you, poetry doesn't sell. So, you know, what are you talking about? I think there's something fundamentally wrong there that needs to be addressed. And the events that uh, she's talking about, there is so much scope. There is, you know, there was this Tatra dancer called Shantarati. I had done a reading of my poetry at uh, the Togo event. This is now talk that happened in Bombay, started by Janet Fine. And she came up to me afterwards and said, uh, I would like to translate your poem into dance. I said, how does that work? Because poem in English and then a dance, how does that work? And we did it. You know, there, there is a lot of scope there with someone who, who translated a poem of mine into, into a theater performance. You know, these are very small efforts, but there is scope to do things that would widen the interest, widen the market. But I, I think fundamentally that lack of interest needs to be dealt with. And the tragedy is that good poets are now turning away because you know, some people like Tavishke, for example, he said, I, I've given up writing poetry, I just read fiction, you know, he's a very well-known novelist, you know, uh, fiction is one of the better things. He says, I, I don't write because he's publishing. Luckily for most poets, it doesn't matter, they will just do what they have to do. In fact, tomorrow in Mumbai, there is a one-day poetry festival happening. I, I'm leaving uh, this conference early because of that. Uh, Heman Bifti is a Marathi poet, and he decided out of sheer passion to publish books of poetry in English. So tomorrow he celebrates a decade of doing this. And I asked him, as, you know, but what about the costing? How does it work? Poetry book is not expensive to do. It is. There are hardly any visuals, you know, it's a, it, it is slim, whatever you might say, it is slimmer than, you know, a lot of novels would be. So, I asked him, who's funding this? And he said, no, I'm putting in my own money because I've made money out of advertising, I want to give it back to poetry. And uh, I said, but if I want to publish poetry, which is something that I have always wanted to do, and distribution has scared me off, 
Uh, listen, see, there are ways of cutting costs. I will always produce two books at a time because the size of the paper means that if I do only one book, the cover is the most expensive. So if I'm printing two covers, I'm not wasting the paper. So there are little things that you know, I'm sure I don't need to tell publishers that these are ways to cut costs. But maybe it's just you know, a way of thinking that needs to be looked at. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, a few days ago, I, uh, were, it was in India, I, I was talking with a Turkish uh, poet and uh, she told me, you know, it's important for me to have a book in France and uh, I can I can find the publisher and I said, never say that to a French publisher. If you say that you can pay him, he will, he will laugh and he will it doesn't work like that, but I know that in some countries it works like that. I mean, it's just a question of. Uh, so here, can uh, uh, is it a way to do? Oh, there's a lot of self-publishing going on. There's uh, yeah, but there's a danger there because you know to bring out a book is all very well. It's a very easy thing to do. To put up your poem, your bleeding hearts, bad poetry on the internet is very easy to do. But it doesn't help you as a poet. You first need to build your reputation, your you know, your name as your credibility as mm. a poet, mm. and then you can afford to do this. Mm. And then it doesn't yeah. matter. Then it, yeah, I see. Yeah. So yeah. you you first you know, magazines get your poems mm. published in yeah. in serious journals, yeah. and even you know online journals now that are very serious ones. The News mm. India, for example, is a very serious journal. But uh, once you've done that, it doesn't matter if you pay for publishing a book or not. Then you know that that's what it is. Yeah. So you see, this is a this is a big difference. Or you just you just publish your own book. Yeah, and you of know, course. Yeah. I mean, Radhi Kari does yeah. that, and it is a brilliant writer. Yeah. yeah, I understand very well. That, that's why I asked because uh, because uh, it's a question of uh, yeah of customs uh, of economy, of course. And yeah, and also risk. Because if people say we don't sell poetry, we don't feed poetry, of course they won't support it economically. Um, I also wanted to ask you something. In France, we do uh, the distinction between diffuser and distributor. Distributor? Yeah. Uh, about books distribution, we have two words. The distributor, it is very uh, technical. It's the one who will send books to uh, bookshops and do this, uh, you know, this job. Accounting. Okay. What do you say? Accounting. Yeah. How many books have been sold? Yeah, all, all that. Uh, and the diffuser is the one who comes to meet the booksellers and promote the book and say you have to sell it, you have to you have to promote this book and uh, this is very important because a lot of poetry publishers have a distributor but no diffuser because they have to pay a lot. It's I think some of them ask sixty percent. 60% of the price of the book to do this job. So this is a lot. <laughs> so some publishers cannot pay for it. And now this is the problem because most of the poetry publishers cannot pay for it. And so it's a very uh, Personal, uh, you know, they have to do this work by themselves to meet the bookshop, to go to book fairs, and, and this is uh, one of the problems they have, one of the limits. Yeah, and it doesn't come naturally to a poet to go around saying, hey, you know, here's my book by Publisher, <laughs> not poet. <laughs> okay, but, but they, they would expect, for, at least in India, they would expect the poet to also cooperate with oh, getting that. Oh, of course. <laughs> getting the message out. Yes, yes, yes. And I think a lot of poets just, you know, 
They just give out their books to friends and say, okay, you know, this <laughs> And good poets, well-known poets like that. Oh. And uh, it is said that, you know, but one, one trend in India is that, uh, which is a good trend, but uh, does have its downside. Uh, there are a lot of anthologies coming up. So, you know, the big publishers will not risk a single poet. But they will bring out a 500-page anthology, the Hapa College anthology. Uh, recently, there was one by Vivekanand Shah called The Dance of the Peacock, which has just come out from, from Canada. Uh, and you know, there, there are lots of these blood acts. Uh, Falcon in the US brought out this section, Jeet Tahir did a very smart thing. He brought out this section on Indian poetry, which he then converted into an anthology in India which he then sold to Blood Axe. So the same version, the same anthology came out, more or less, you know, similar, to three different publishers. And I asked him, how did you do that? How did you get them to agree? And he said, well, different markets. It works. Why not? You know. So there is sort of common in his life. No, they want to know. Blood Axe is not going to be something that's going to infringe on rights. So I discovered that my poem was in a blood axe anthology and I had no clue until six months after it appeared. Mm. How does it work for rights? Yeah. Usually the poet has the copyright. Yeah. So the poet has the copyright, the poet has the copyright. So even in my, uh, the SYD textbook mm. this year, second year college textbook, has a poem of mine. The poor children are studying my poem. I'm really sorry for that, but we study it. But the copyright remains with me. You know, it's not, it's not something I have given them. No. Because they told me, you know, we'd like to keep the, the cost down of the book so we can sell it to the students. So, would you mind giving it to us free? Mm -hmm. uh, I thought about it and I said, okay, because. If I give them the copyright, the next time someone wants to publish that poem, I need to go back to them and say, you know, we need to give permission. Mm. Which I don't want to get into that situation, and just as well, because someone in uh, Gettysburg wrote to me, she found that poem somewhere and wrote to me and said, I want to publish a poem. Mm. In the seminary which review, you know, it's a poem about God and mm. Indies, and, you know. Um, so it's very, very serious seminary which review anthology has my poem about my human ideas. Mm -hmm. And luckily I didn't have any issues with asking the university, yes. mm -hmm. is it okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. But if there are any questions as you're speaking, please. Uh, yeah. Do you write for children? Mostly? I mean, I believe in starting early and exposing yeah. children to poetry early on. I know in the US, you know, there are poetry months which are really the schools promote. So do we see any kind of movement or do you see any kind of movement like that happening in India? Like it's promoting poetry in schools and do you go out and meet uh, children or college students and uh, are you asking for me personally? Yeah, any kind of uh, are there, are there there events like that? I think or? there are uh, yeah, there are some people present this event I'm doing in Bombay next week. Uh, there is this lady called Rati Vaudia, who is an English teacher. She taught me, she taught my elder sister who was 10 years older. She's been to female school for 40 years. She's retired now. So I told her to do a workshop with kids. So she's got children from six schools. She did a similar thing last year for Chantis Ren. And children from six schools, last year was a Shakespeare workshop. But she wove in the environment, she wove in, you know, peace, she got kids to sing, and she's going to do a similar thing this year. So there is, you know, and that there is an interest. And it comes very naturally to kids if they're encouraged. Right. There is a huge potential which uh, must be tapped for that. There's a whole, you know, uh, there's a website by Ken Nesbitt on, uh, you know, reading poetry and, you know, fun stuff that children would love and enjoy. So any such genre evolution in poetry for children and, and I love being poetry. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of scope in our tribal areas also because um, last year for the 7,000 Poets for Change event that we did, we did a workshop with the Bandhanwadi village school kids. Now these are 
children of tribals, the parents are being assimilated into the so-called modern culture, forgetting their language, forgetting their songs. So the children are also losing that. So we worked with them. There was so much enthusiasm. I had to sort of reduce the volume because it's so excited. Poetry and songs. Poetry folk songs and very, very, uh, you know, you think that it's very traditional and conservative uh, family situations. But the songs were all about uh, men and women working in the fields and then coming home. And then the man is not sitting back and saying, I'm tired of doing food. They're both working together, they're enjoying a drink together, husband and wife, private people, and organizing their food. And you know, there's so much of that togetherness that we the social narrative. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot that poetry can achieve. But it needs publishers' support, you know, whatever, you know. Okay, poets, poets will survive no matter what. Poets will do what they have to do. But if it gets the push from big publishers who can say, okay, we're going to distribute your books, we're going to promote your books, that will make a world of difference. A poetry as a genre of writing has always been very popular among the literature lovers. It's a fact. Because they um, listen to that, they attain the uh, you know, Kavita publishers, poetry recitals and receptions, and then recite it at home also. But, uh, and a uh, lot of those happen also all over the country and all over the globe also. There are these poetry recital sessions, poetry festivals. Fiction festivals are not there. Novel festivals are not there. And why is it that when it comes, it comes to publishing and the selling, um, it, it can all be at the first glance of uh, again to end the first listening to it. And why it happens that uh, when it comes to printing and then to uh, solution and setting. You know, I think it goes back to this whole issue of the way it is taught in schools in very early days. Exactly. Because we are still in the Wordsworth Tennyson age, we are still, you know, because there is a lot of critical material available. So to teach, you know, the 19th century, the 18th century, it's easier. Whereas if you're grappling with contemporary poetry and you're trying to teach it, there's a lot of scope to misunderstand what is being said. And I saw this for a fact at a women's seminar that I went to, a national women poet seminar I went to in March. And uh, someone who was, uh, you know, he talked about a friend, a poet I know, very big name now. Uh, he read her lines and he completely misunderstood what she said, and, you know, a rice carrots or a lover, I postpone the latter. And he made this bizarre comment that this poem is about, you know, Mumbai being very very busy, people are very busy, they don't even have time to make love. I said, huh, that's not what she's saying. You know, that's that's not at all what she's saying. So I texted her while this session was going on. And uh, she said, oh my god, you know, <laughs> I'll speak to this guy and get That is more so you uh, don't understand probably. And he's no. an enthal guy, he's an enthal guy to someone who's doing an enthal on this girl's book. That's so sad. It's, See, there is this view that poetry is very obscure, you know, modern poetry, especially. So I was just reading this is fantastic book, it is in my bag. This is a book by Ruth Farrell, The Poem and the Journey. And 60 poems to read along the way. She talks about how you read poetry and how you understand it. And she points out that 2,000 years ago, this comedian, this comic, you know, Aristophanes was making fun of poetry being obscure. So she said it's not a new complaint. You know, poetry is, is as obscure as you choose to have it read. You know. If you give it that thought and that time, it will unfold itself. And, and there was this other article that I found on the internet by a guy called Roger Houston. He talks about the necessity of poetry. And he says that, you know, every time he thinks, so why am I writing poetry? And then he realizes how much it changes you. I can't read the entire thing. You'll find it online. But just two lines at the end. Artists and poets are the raw nerve ends of humanity. 
by themselves, they can do little to save humanity. Without them, there would be little worth saving. Ma'am, just to add a little bit of your fear. No. Oh, sorry. You know, everyone criticizes publishers for saying that poetry doesn't sell. Uh, I'd like to make two points from two ends of the spectrum. I think at one level, maybe the mechanism we are using to sell poetry is, is incorrect, it's wrong. You know, maybe we are using the template from the non-fiction world. Even, even fiction is hard to sell in that sense. Because it's so subjective that, you know, I'm interested in my poetry, I'm not interested in yours, that kind of thing. So there is an element of, uh, you know, and as she was pointing out, it varies from culture to culture. So, you know, inheriting the Anglo-Saxon tradition, what is not important to us, and the way we teach it in school tradition. So, so it's much more complex than, uh, than that. On the other hand, you see a lot of people decry what we used to call vanity publishing, in that sense. Today the big houses have gone in for their own self-publishing arts. And self-publishing has become a reality because of technology. So we need to look at the other options of, of what are coming into the market itself. Mm -hmm. Ravindranath Tagore, for example, he didn't go to any publisher to get the tangent in that sense. He probably went to a printer directly. And, uh, you know, I see no reason why self-publishing should be criticized or, or you know, uh, treated as secondary anymore. We need to look at the full range of possibilities. Publishing in a traditional mold is probably becoming redundant as you know we don't need such big presses to actually come out of books. So it, it has taken things, you know, sitting on a desktop computer you can actually do half of the process here. So what does it mean for the process of, of producing works now? I don't know. Of course the danger with self publishing is that a lot of bad poetry gets out there and ruins everybody's image of perception of poetry. A lot of bad poetry going on in the mainstream also. Yeah, but that's but at least you know poets who are conscious of what they're doing, they you know, they're careful of what they publish, will take their time. They may end up self publishing, but they will take their time and ensure that they don't make fools of themselves while they're doing it. There is a problem with the way we are promoting uh, poetry, there's no doubt about it. There is a problem with the way we are not holding these events, you know, that culture is not there. So there are, pro there are structural problems here. But I think to blame the publishers alone is unfair. And, uh, you know, we need to look at some kind of solution rather than just uh, analyze this. Sure. Way. No, my, my limited point was that publishers have always told us poetry doesn't sell. Exactly. My perception as a poet who has grown up watching and talking to a lot of very well-known poets who have shaped contemporary poetry today, is that if publishers say that, that's fine, it doesn't matter. True. No, your point is very valid that they don't promote it, so it won't sell. It's a chicken yeah. and egg situation. It's a chicken and egg thing. So what do but, but having said that, you do need one missing Ezekiel to make Bombay the city of, of uh, Indo Anglian writing, if you want to call it that, in, in India, of Indo Anglian poetry. If it wasn't for him, half of, half of the poets of Bombay would have not been there. People criticize uh, self publishing P. Lal from Writer's Workshop. He had a Quite a controversial model where he required you to take 200 out of 500 copies. But if he was not there, half of our writers, uh, at least you know the Goan writers in English, would have not been there because he was he was uh, you know filling the gap in a time when to publish English in India was seen as a anomaly. At a later stage, he became very non-selective, so I consciously refused to be published by writers workshop. At the solstice hour. People dressed in wood lure into the early sage, birds without faces. The wandering stream drops towards the shores, its memories of snow. My sylvan trees have reddened with summer's first day. The man from the town said that was rust blowing from Japan, but they don't know that the trees in this school, in their deepest secret roots, stroke living stones that start to dream that the wind and the rain will take them naked on clay at the solstice hour. When you and I were about to break, 
there is no question of a fight over who will take the cups and who the sources. Use filled over with steel, meniscus rippling with the slightest touch. I, supine on the floor, licked the milk once meant for you. Both of us with China at that point. One of us had been to China too, known the meaning of porcelain freedoms, sniffed red guards. One of us had known the sound of an alien tongue, harsh and guttural as it came from smiling mouths. Our smiles were circular, yours and mine, yours from the top of the tea and mine below, two halves joined together on separate wings. When we blew at each other, the crockery stayed firm. And who but you and I would know the liquid moved? No, there was no fight over chipped white cups. Pieces lay upon the kitchen floor. And I, I moved to tea parties in other living rooms, balancing alien porcelain on a frigid farm. Thank you, speakers. Uh, we'll end session over here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs>